Hey guys, and welcome back to a new Android architectural video. And this video is about use cases. And I'll give you five mistakes people commonly make with use cases. Why do I know that these are common mistakes? Well, because I have a mentorship program in which I frequently review other people's code. And these people are people just like you. So they have similar problems, similar goals. And I just see a few mistakes being made over and over again. The loyal viewers among you might know that I am personally not too big of a friend of use cases at least not sticking to them too strictly. If you like them and you apply them strictly in your product, that's all fine, but then you should do it right. So let's see what those mistakes are. Use case number one, validate user data use case. And for each of these, I will give you a little moment uh, to think about what the mistake could be. So feel free to pause here for a moment, take a look at this class, and then let me know what the mistake actually is. All right. We have a valid data use case here. We have a function whether a full name is valid and whether a password is valid. And the problem with this use case is that it has two public functions. However, a use case should only do a single thing. It should only have one public exposed function. Because here in this class, if you're strict, then you are violating the single responsibility principle because is this class now used for validating a full name or is it used for validating a password? Those are two kind of distinct things and therefore also two reasons to change this class because your password validation logic could change or because your full name validation logic could change. And that hints to a violation of the single responsibility principle, which is pretty much the whole reason why we want to create use cases since they isolate one piece of logic in a class. So in this case, you would need to split this up into a uh, validate full name use case and into a validate password use case. It's not wrong to use multiple functions in a use case, but only one of these should be public. So you can create private utility functions just to split up a logic a little bit, make it more readable, um, but that should still be um, for, the, for the main purpose of this use case. All right, coming to mistake number two and opening use case number two. We have a format social stat use case. So all this use case really does is it takes in a number and formats that based on what you maybe know from Instagram. If a user has 999 followers, this function will format it as it is. If a user has some kind of larger number of followers, this will be formatted with a K at the end, indicating it's in thousands. And if the user has millions of followers, these, uh, this use case will format it as 1 million or 1.5 million or whatever um, kind of number that will be. So again, pause a moment and think about what the mistake would be here. Okay, the mistake in this use case is that whoever wrote this <clears throat> um, did not understand what a business logic really means. Because in the end, use cases are located in our domain layer. That means they need to contain our business logic, the business logic of our app. And I see most people actually struggle with recognizing what business logic really is. Because what we see here in this use case isn't really business logic. How could I tell that? Well, because the whole purpose of this use case is bringing a data type, this number, into a format that is well presentable to our user. So it takes in some kind of not so readable number and brings it into a format that is much more readable and displayable on our UI. And while I explained this, I already used the keywords presentable and UI. And that's a strong indicator that this is actually presentation logic. So strictly speaking, logic like this should go in your presentation layer. And it's really just like formatting a date, for example. That's also presentation logic. Since you will rarely need a formatted date in your domain layer or in your data layer, that's always something that is directly displayed to the user. So you just take some kind of unreadable data type, for example, a Unix timestamp, which is just a long number, and you bring that into a readable data type that you want to display on the UI, in this case, a formatted date, or just a formatted social stat number like here. So what now really is business logic if it's not that? Business logic is in the end the logic that is specific to the domain of your app. Sounds very complex, I know, and if you're hearing this the first time, it's not clear to you, I know. But you can often spot business logic when your actual app's requirements describe what should happen and not how more things should happen. So a typical example here would again, for example, be password validation. If we take a look at our password function, then your requirements of this particular app you're building will outline what makes a valid password. That isn't something that's just general knowledge. No, that's something that is very specific to the domain of your app. If you would have a different domain, like a banking app, then these requirements could differ because that's a different domain, since banking apps might need more password security 
than a social media app. I don't know. And what business logic does not include is the implementation details of this logic. So if we imagine something like a logout use case, for example, what would a logout use case really do? Well, it would maybe call a function logout from the repository. It would maybe clear the local cache of your app. It would maybe uh, stop scheduling any further notifications you would otherwise get when you're logged in. This particular order of things that need to be done would be specified in a use case. So the use case really only outlines what needs to happen, but the use case does not know how things really work behind the scenes. It doesn't know which endpoint that logout request is fired, that it's actually a request at all that is fired. It doesn't know how the actual cache is cleared, how the token is cleared. It just knows that these things have to happen. And the actual logic behind these things is then abstracted out in the data layer. All right, great, I hope that's clear. Let's dive into mistake number three and open this validate email use case. As I already mentioned before, here for validation, you would just have one use case per type of validation. So validate full name use case, validate password use case, and validate email use case could also be a use case. So that seems to be fine here, but can you spot the mistake? So let's take a look at this use case. It takes in an email returns a boolean whether that email is valid or not, which is all fine, and then makes use of this patterns email address matcher, which is a function or functionality that comes from the Android SDK. How do I know that? Well, because the import contains that it comes from Android. However, what really is the purpose of a domain layer in the use case? The purpose is that domain needs to be completely isolated from the rest of the application. And isolated means your domain layer should not contain any references to the data layer. It should not contain any references to your presentation layer and potential external libraries and frameworks you're using. And strictly speaking, an external dependency or framework is already the Android SDK. Because one goal of having an isolation like this that we don't allow Android-specific dependencies, like this patterns class, is that that allows us to easily reuse our domain layer even in non-Android products. Imagine something like a Kotlin multi-platform project, for example. Right now, your domain layer would not be reusable if a use case uses this patterns import, since that's only available on an Android platform. But if you're building a Kotlin multi-platform app, then that doesn't mean that you would be able to use the same patterns class across all platforms KMP supports. And that's why we want to keep things isolated. So really only use in domain layer what the Kotlin standard library provides and what you could use in a pure Kotlin project. So using something like coroutines and flows, that would be okay, since you could use that in any Kotlin project, no matter if KMP or Android or whatever. But any implementation details, like which database you use, um, which SGP client you use, or what kind of operating system you develop for, that doesn't belong in the domain layer. And in order to still be able to use this patterns class in Android, which is quite useful, since you don't need to come up with your own regular expression or so, you don't need to test that and all that stuff, you would need to abstract this out. So here for use case three, you would have something like an email pattern validator that needs to be an interface. You would make a function is um, valid email, pass in your email as a string get back a boolean, whether it's valid or not. And then in your data layer, you would have that email pattern, let's call it Android email pattern validator. Something like this, which would then implement this email pattern validator. And here we could then safely use our patterns import, email address matcher, email matches. Since here we are instead of our data layer, not domain anymore, and in the data layer it's completely fine to know about implementation details because that's exactly what the data layer is used for. And in your validate email use case, you would then, instead of calling this directly, um, you would just call your oops, email pattern validator, which you would inject here. Private val validator is an email pattern validator, and you would return a validator that is valid email and email. And here you can already see one reason why I'm usually not a big fan of uh, sticking to use cases too strictly, because they often introduce a lot of boilerplate code, just like here, where they just delegate a call to another class or another abstraction in this case. But if you would want to do it 100% correctly in clean architecture, this is how it would need to be done. And as you can see, this import is now gray, not needed anymore, and we can get rid of it. Let's get to the next use case. Open that one here, and I will close all tabs here to open this login use case. Can you spot what could be wrong here? 
And to be fair, this isn't a mistake that's generally always an, uh, a mistake with use cases, but uh, very often. So let's take a look. We have a login use case. That login use case takes in repository, an auth repository, and in this case just delegates a call with some uh, login domain model. But I've actually already went over this in a separate video that you can see we have a suspend use case here. That's an interface, an abstraction of a use case, of a general use case that where the execute function is suspending. That itself is nothing wrong. But I often see people create such abstractions just for the sake of creating abstractions. They hear somewhere that abstractions make an architecture clean just by definition, and therefore they abstract everything they can abstract. And while abstractions generally of course have their own purpose, and they are great when you actually take advantage out of them, that doesn't mean that you can take advantage out of every single abstraction or that you will really do this. Because abstraction only makes sense if you have or plan to have at least two implementations of it. And usually you have two abstractions for an app if you apply proper testing. But even then, you don't need abstractions for every single class. So the whole purpose is just if you have such a use case and that use case is used somewhere, is injected somewhere, let's say in a view model, and you would then want to test the view model logic in isolation. So without caring about the results of the classes the view model uses, but only the, the code that the view model itself executes, then you could pass a so-called test double for the use case since it's an abstraction. You could create your own kind of test instance for that use case, pass that to your test view model instance, and then test the view model logic in isolation. However, people, first of all, need to get started with uh, using testing at all. And if you apply testing, then isolating something like the view model, which uses use cases, is usually not the best place for that to start. In my experience, test cases are much more helpful if you actually use the real logic such use cases really um, add, since use cases don't really contain any external libraries you need to abstract out, like a HTTP client or database, which you wouldn't want to use in your test cases. No, use cases only contain raw business logic, which is really fast and easy to execute. And that is usually logic you want to execute in your test cases. So in most of the cases, it makes absolute sense to just use the normal instances of your use cases in your test cases, and you're just if you really feel the need to isolate the classes that use your use cases and you really feel the need to test these in isolation, then it's all good to create an abstraction like here. But in my experience, 99% of people who write such an abstraction for a use case don't really take any advantage out of that for testing. So in that case, you can really just remove this logic and make your code a lot less complex because every single added abstraction makes your code more complex since it's one more class you need to dive through in order to understand what something does in your code. Also get rid of this override and then you also have a perfectly clean use case. If you want to see me talk about this topic in detail, then I will link a video up here where I already did that. Well, let's now come to the last mistake of this video and that is in our use case 5 package. We have a validate password use case again. It has a single function, it takes in a password as an input and then returns a result. For take a look what a result really is, that's just a data class wrapper which returns whether that uh, password validation was successful, whether it's a valid password, or an, an optional error if there is one. And you can see if the password is empty, we say, okay, it's not valid. Password can be empty is the error. If the password length is less than nine, then we say, okay, the password length must be at least nine. And otherwise we say, okay, that's actually valid and we don't have any error message. So what really is the mistake here? And this mistake is already very closely related to one I already talked about, that parts of this password validation don't belong in this use case. While password validation itself is absolutely business logic, it's not business logic to decide which error message gets shown on the UI. So it's not the responsibility of the use case to decide which specific string the user will see in the end on the UI. Because in the end, an error message is always meant to present it to some kind of user or developer. So it's really either just something you show on the UI or you put in some kind of log and see in the crash logs or error logs. And both that is directly related to presenting something. So the use case should not know which error message gets shown because that way you would also not be able to localize that very easily because that would require you to use uh, resources, Android string resources, um, map these results here or map these error messages to some kind of string resource IDs. And then you again have that Android reference in the use case since you need to refer to R to the resource class and you again violate this. How should you do it instead? Well, for that, I have another very detailed video which I will link up here. 
but all in all, you just create a result wrapper class which lets you pass custom error types in form of enum values. So you have defined enum values that all correspond to individual errors, like in this case, password too short, um, password no uppercase, password no uh, lowercase, password no digit. And you just return these enum values to your UI, to your view model. And the view model that is in the presentation layer, so the view model can just loop over these um, errors or just... Uh, check these in a win expression. Okay, if the password error is actually too short, I know the password was too short. That is what the use case computed. So the view model can then take this enum and just map it to the corresponding string resource where you all find since the view model is in the presentation layer and that's just the responsibility of the view model. And if you want to see proper architecture applied in practice, check my more advanced Android Premium courses down below where we build real projects from the real world. These projects are bigger than what I can actually show in a simple YouTube tutorial. Seriously, check them out. And other than that, thanks so much for watching this video. I will see you back in the next one. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye.